Oh, thank you, thank you, Kathy, for that wonderful introduction. And thank you, attendees, for taking the time to attend today. And those who have returned, thank you very much for being a part of this. The insights you will learn today that you will receive can make a difference in how you experience resolving your own conflicts. The focus today will be on the individual and how he or she handles those conflicts. And our objective today will be to become more self-aware and develop the skill level that will resolve your personal conflict in a healthy and effective manner. We will look at some tools today that are represented by the hammer. We will spark some new ideas, I hope, represented by the light bulb. We will resolve some conflict steps as represented by man. And then I will finish with some language phrases to help people within this area. And that is represented by the brain. I'm requesting today that you engage in our discussions and interaction activities. I encourage you to take some notes or if you'd like to take screenshots, that's okay too. I will offer my slides to the district upon completion of the workshop. You will also be asked to participate in a conflict survey and using the chat with, our, with your responses. And Kathy has so graciously offered to read as we go through those chats so everyone can hear all of the responses. So moving on, conflict is inevitable. We work with human beings. Conflict encompasses a broad spectrum from individuals, small groups, larger groups, communities, nation, and the world. But we also include mediation, negotiation, but the very first step in any aspect of building a skill begins with self. This is an interpersonal skill. The stronger you are in building strong relationships, the easier the conflict is to handle. And let me repeat that again. The stronger you are in building relationships, the easier the conflict is to handle. Now, Gandhi's quote exemplifies the objectives that we will be examining today. My wish is that you will develop some of these beliefs from today's insights that will reflect positively in terms of you handling your own conflict. Because what you believe becomes your thoughts. Your thoughts then become your words. Your words become your actions. Your actions become your habits. Your habits become your value. And your values become your destiny. This is an impactful quote. And I hope at the end of the workshop, we can go back and look at this again to see what greater beliefs or insights you have developed. Let's really begin now with the definition so we're all on the same page. We need a common understanding. And the process that you go through internally is the same process you go through externally. 
So we have two ways. We either deal with it inside or we deal with it outside. Now, an internal means that we have opposing ideas within ourselves. For instance, an example is kind of like um, uh, you want to buy a new car, but you're not sure you have the money for that. So the conflict is, do I buy it? Do I not buy it? You go through that kind of process every day with some aspect of your life. But the way you resolve it through problem solving is similar to what you do externally as well. Today, we're going to look at external only. And that means the definition is opposing ideas between two or more people who perceive, and that's the key word, they perceive their goal to be incompatible. When we were looking or talking earlier about the contests, those people who were developed a, a conflict there perceived that they could not have agreeable ideas. The word resolution means the steps or the process that you go through to resolve. And conflict management is the system that you use to manage all your conflicts. So today, we're only talking about resolution and from the individual's point of view. So let's look at some statistics for a moment. 33% of the workplace conflict is a result of heavy workloads. Now we have that in, in Toastmasters as well. There are people who allow themselves to become so overloaded with work that it creates conflict without them intending to have that happen. 25% of employees have been absent or sick due to workplace conflict. 9% of employees have even seen projects fail because of workplace conflict. We've also seen that in Toastmasters. I've seen things occur because of that. And I also learned today that the FAA has included uh, conflict training for pilots, not only to work between co-pilot and pilot, but even people within sitting passengers who are sitting on the airplane, which often has uh, uh, issues that come up that are not planned for. So all transportation, and I'm almost sure that there is not an organization today that isn't doing something about conflict. The problem is that we often, they tell people what to do, and then people haven't internalized the ideas or the insights, and then when it occurs, they don't know what to do. So I hope today that you will take a look at that so that our statistics within our group will go down a little bit. And to do that, let's find out what this group thinks. So I'm going to let AJ put a link for you to go to the survey, and she will tell you what to do with that. So let's find out what we think. So AJ, go for it. Thanks so much, Charlotte. Yes, we're bringing up the... Charlotte's Conflict Survey. This is provided by a group called Mentimeter. So you can take your phone right now and point it at the screen and take a picture of that QR code you see there and it will immediately open up to Charlotte's Survey. If you don't want to do it with your phone, we invite you to use the chat where I will be putting in the link to menti.com. Simply join us at www.menti.com and use the code 8730-1816 to join us in Charlotte's Conflict Survey. Again, that code at menti.com is 8730-1816.
Now that we're all set up, we can go back and have Charlotte take us through the survey. Charlotte. Thank you very much, AJ. The purpose of our survey today is for us to look at and evaluate the comfort that you have with stress. Also, looking at evaluating club or team culture. Think about this as you relate to your own club or your own group that you might be working with within Toastmasters or any other organization. And then becoming a better teammate. The more you understand how you function, the better it will be for everyone else. So, the first question for your consideration is how do you handle conflict? You have four responses. The first one is yes, you always handle it. Uh, maybe yes, you do it sometimes. No, almost never. And then there are those that never uh, handle conflict. They just let it go by. Well, it looks like we have some pretty good, we have the majority of people are in, on the yes side. They do handle it sometimes. More, uh, I have more accounts of people who handle it always. And that's good. But we also have some people that don't handle it often. So our next question for your consideration will ask you how much you agree or disagree with each question in relationship to conflict. You ignore conflict, you sometimes you engage, you're a middle of the roader, your comfort with conflict, you initiate conflict or you just hate conflict. So it looks like we have a good number of people that are middle of the roaders. So that's good to know. Take a look now as we move forward of where you might want to just grow a little more towards strongly agreeing, where you really maybe will be more comfortable with conflict after hearing our comments and gaining insights today. So I thank you for participating in my survey. And now we will move on and catch the next group of uh, for this. So give me just a minute and we'll go right into here and move into the next section. As I mentioned, conflict is inevitable. It's a choice. You have a choice and you need to remember that. You can either, there are two ways. You either can approach it from a negative point of view, which is unhealthy, or a positive approach, which is more healthy. So let me go through some of the negative things that happen if you use this approach. And you know, you've been with it, but there are some things that are coming out more readily now in terms of wellness. It does lead to violence and it doesn't have to be heavy violence. It can be a small, subtle violence. Sarcasm, that kind of thing can be a very subtle uh, violence. It also, the stress harms the body physically. We have a chemical, not only does it go into our body with adrenaline, it also goes to the cortex of your brain through norepinephrine which causes you to block. And so making decisions when you're under high stress is very difficult. I learned that when I was voted in as district director for 100, the stress really hit me and I had a minor heart attack the second month that I was in district directorship. I really didn't know what that stress was doing for me to me. So uh, I, I had an idea, but you know what I did? I ignored it. And that's not healthy. So I want to make sure that we check this. Okay, there's a question. Oh, you want to read that, Kathy? AJ has something for everyone there. I see it here. The question is, 
does this mean that if we rated ourselves as avoiding or hating conflict, it means we have a negative approach? Could be, absolutely. If you're not attending to the problem, yes, it creates even more stress that you may not even know it's happening. So it is better to handle it and handle it in a healthy way. And let me go, it does undermine communication, relationships, uncooperativeness, resolving, you're not resolving the real issues. But the thing that is so great is that it's really hurtful. And we are not in the business of hurting people. So we want to choose the positive and healthy approach. If you are using and resolving your conflict in a healthy way, it can be very creative, not only for you, but maybe for the team you're working with. And it's also innovative. Ideas that would never have come up have come up as a result of conflict and discussion. And I'm not talking about disagree disagreeing. I'm talking about going beyond that, that it is really a difference of opinion perceived. It supports the body physically with serotonin. It strengthens communication. The other thing that it does is some people often will hold in their feelings. And when you're resolving conflict, it releases some of those pinned up feelings that they haven't had the courage or they haven't had the time to share. And of course, it leads to solutions. One of the things that happens when you're making a, a positive choice is you stay in solutions, not the problem. That's an important factor. And then, of course, it helps for growth to uh, to do that. So moving on. I have another question. Yeah, good. Also from AJ, conflict and conflict management is highly used in high tech development teams. That's a comment. Great. Yeah, thank you, AJ. And please feel free to add if you have a comment that you want to express. Remember, this is interactive, so want to make sure that you have time to to share. All right, some of the causes, and these are really an interesting aspect because most of the time in my experience with conflict at, in schools, in in nations, and when I worked with Arab and, and Israeli students, misunderstandings and sensitivity was number one. They misunderstood the language that was being used. So one of the things that you really want to look at is what language, what words are being used? And do you, as a part of this conflict, do you understand those? And we'll get into the language phrases in a little bit. Sensitivity. Some people get their feelings hurt really easily. And so you need to be aware of that. Prejudices and biases. We all have them. Do you know yours? Are you able to list and prejudices that you have and be able to admit to them? That is part of the process of learning who you are. And we all have them. Found most like, likely to happen in Toastmasters. When we ask, someone to do something, our expectations are, or we're not real clear. This, and they think they know how to do that. Then they go to the job and they find out, no, they don't. And then they're embarrassed to tell you that they can't finish it up. And so now we have a problem. So unfulfilled expectations. Watch what you expect people to do on your team and the language you use to give directions for that. And differences in value, culture, and perceptions. And I'll come back to perceptions in a minute. 
Differences over facts and priorities. One of the things that I recently encountered in the last couple of days having to do with contests is priorities. Some people think money is the most important to charge for contests. Some people think it is not. Whether you do hybrid or not hybrid, all of those things are people have differences in priorities and it takes, well, we'll talk about solutions later. Differences in methods, resources, and power position are another aspect. Do you realize the amount of power in your position that you emanate to others or think that they think you have? It's important to look at that. High emotional energy around perceived differences and the emotions get really heavy at this time. And we'll be talking about that in a little bit. But I want to go back to perceptions now because I'm going to show you a picture. I want you to look at this picture and in the chat or verbally, because there aren't too many people here, I want you to tell me what you see. You may have seen this picture before, but look at your first impression. What do you see? Anybody want to make a comment? I see from I a young lady. Uh -huh. uh, from okay. Kelly. Redmond. Excellent. Anybody see anything different? And Kelly sees a woman. And what kind of a woman? A young woman. Okay, great. Diana sees a young lady, AJ, a beautiful young woman with a choker necklace. And okay. yes. And okay. then now Arifa is able to see the old woman. And oh, did somebody see, see an woman. old woman in here? Diana D, do you see the old woman? Diana, are yes. you there? Yes, I see. Yeah. I, I've seen this before. My first impression was young but I hunted out and could not. Oh, okay. Go. Would you please now, you're in court and you're having to give a description. If you want someone else to see what you see, would you please describe about the old woman so someone else can see that as well? Okay. Try anyway. <laughs> Have I will fun try. with it. <laughs> The first thing I did was look for the old woman's mouth because that helps a lot. If you follow the top boundary between the white and her black coat and you go across the picture, in between there's a white gap with a V of whiteness. And that is that black line there is the mouth with the chin projecting down and above that mouth is a nose. Does that help people? Is there someone that still does not see the old woman? Anybody? Does everyone see the old woman? That's a good comment by Mary. The young lady's chin uh -huh. is the old woman's uh -huh. nose. Nose, right. Now... I want you to think about what Diana had to do to help you see her point of view. She had to explain to you, and oftentimes if we were to do this in a room where lots of people could discuss um, uh, in person, they often will say, I still don't see her. You, when you give people direction, activities to do, when you want people to see your point of view, details are extremely important, but you got to stop along the way like Diana did and say, does that help you to see? This skill is very important when you're trying to negotiate a, a solution, because if they don't see what you see, it doesn't matter what you do you will not be able to help them see what's happening with you. 
So it's important. If you haven't done this, you might want to get Stephen Covey's book on seven habits of effective people and practice seeing because the book, the picture comes from his book. So very good. Any comments about this? Did anybody feel like they didn't resolve the issue here? Okay. Hearing nothing, I'll move on. I do have one comment, Charlotte, yeah. and, and okay. that has to do with the tone that you use when you're trying to see if someone can see, uh -huh. when you're Excellent. trying to explore. You can't see your nose. If If I say, what do you mean you can't see your nose? <laughs> I'm just adding to the conflict because now it sounds like what's wrong with you. Right. Absolutely. Excellent, AJ, that you brought that up. Not only words, and, and we will get into the emotion. Um, it, and I want you to think about the difference between reacting and responding. Reacting is not doing any thinking about what you're doing or what you, how you're behaving. And, and responding means that you're stopping. And sometimes I'll say to people, oh, wait a minute, let me, let me take my, let me look more. Give me a moment. Don't rush me in trying to, to do this. So those are all excellent points. Thank you, AJ, for making that. Let's move into now whether you want to engage in conflict or not. There are times when you don't need to, you can, you don't have to engage. Um, okay, uh, Kathy, I think we have a question. Can you read that? Yes, Andrew Greener would like to know, what if the other person refuses to see your point? Yeah, we will do that. We'll talk about that. That's a very good question. So hold on to that. And I will get to that uh, when we get a little bit further down. Part of this engagement will make a difference for your question also. Okay. There are, this is you and them. So let's look at it as two, uh, either individual or group. You need to know what your level of interest in is in taking care of this conflict. If your interest is low, very low, you, you, there, it's just not there. And their interest is low. It's just something that came up. Then don't bother getting engaged in it. It's not worth it. Take the time and say, oh, I can see. Now, how do you know if they're interest is low. I start my engagement by saying, on a scale of one to five, how interested are you in resolving this conflict? Because then I know if they say a two, I can say, oh, well, let's just forget it. If they tell me a five, then I will change and I will move then to the next step because I have low interest, but they have high interest, then I'm going to concede to them, oh, just go ahead and do what you feel you need to do. And then I don't feel guilty about doing that because it's not that important or it's not of high interest to me. Then the next step of going up a little higher is that you have high interest. My, I have a high interest, but they have a low interest. Then now is when I am going to advocate for my point of view. And Andrew, your question can be answered somewhat in this point. Before I ever start to advocate, I ask them if they are willing to listen to my point of view. If they say, no, I don't have time now, or no, I'm really not interested, then I don't waste my breath because it isn't going to work anyway. 
if they say, well, yeah, I, but, but I have interest, but I don't have time today, then I will ask them if I can meet with them after a meeting or if I can Zoom with them or if I, we can have coffee so that I can advocate for my position. This is a good opportunity to do some teaching of your perception. Uh, but again, you're going to ask if they're interested, because if they're not, then you're just wasting. Now, that doesn't mean that they may not be interested later. Maybe after they've seen you do what you're doing, they may come back to you and say, hey, you know, I, I noticed that you were doing this, blah, 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 whatever. I think I might want to know more. I've had people do that where they've come back to me later and then i can even advocate more from my point of view i always make sure they understand my language they understand the words i'm using and sometimes i've had to bring my language down i don't i'm not you know those of us who are academia we tend to use words that half the population doesn't even understand so you have to learn to bring that language down uh, or you uh, try to keep it where they feel the most comfortable. And then the last step on whether you are going to engage or not has to do with you both are, have high interests. This is going to help us. It's going to make the club better. It's going to make the contest better but we will spend some time solving it and we'll get to the, the steps in a little bit. But this is when you actually collaborate for an agreement. Are we? Can we agree that we will resolve this? Now, I want to talk a little bit. I have another question that came in. Yeah, great. From, okay. From Andrew. Andrew says, what if the interaction is a reprimand and they are unaware of an issue? Yeah. Okay, reprimand is not conflict. Reprimand is a directive when you're trying to help somebody improve. And we don't do reprimands uh, in, a, in a negative way. They're always done in a positive manner with a positive tone. So uh, if you are using, if you are, criticizing somebody and particularly in Toastmasters we don't criticize we give feedback and feedback is not critically reprimanding somebody now if somebody's reprimanding you in that process you can just say I'm sorry but this is not a good time for me to resolve I need to do this when we can talk in a more positive manner and you walk away. Does that answer that, Andrew? Andrew, can you come? Okay, great. Thank you. I want to talk a minute about the difference between compromise and consensus. Because this is, these are two concepts that are used in conflict, solving, resolving. Compromise means that somebody is a loser, period. Somebody has to lose in a compromise. You have, a, a, when you're, if I win, but you don't get everything you wanted, you are losing. I'm putting you in a loser position. So it's better to move to consensus, although you can use both. Consensus means it's a win-win process. I'm looking for you. What will help you in this situation so that we both can walk away feeling good and that we have developed consensus in this idea? That's important. I also want to share that leaders need to use these two concepts when they hold DEC meetings or when they are voting on something. Because oftentimes it is a good idea to explain the difference because there are some people who give up or they lose something and then they walk around like a loser afterwards. 
And so they have, what they've done is resigned to being a victim. And that's an important aspect. You want people to walk out of any voting uh, meeting. They don't have to agree, but you want them to feel that they're not a loser either. Now, one of the drawbacks about doing a consensus is it takes time. It is not something that can be done immediately. It takes more discussion. It takes more understanding. It takes longer. But oftentimes when I have led meetings and I want a consensus in that meeting, be it a trio meeting, be it a deck meeting, be it an annual meeting, whatever, I will set the goal that I'm shooting for. If I want consensus, I will say, I want consensus in this decision. If it takes more time for us to, to come to a consensus, all right. That lets people in the meeting know what your expectations are, and they may be more willing to resolve the conflict if they know your goal is, particularly if they respect you and they feel that you're being honest they may go with a consensus and not walk out feeling like they're a loser. Now, I'm not saying that works 100% of the time, but I think a leader needs to have some goal so that we don't end up arguing and spending time doing conflict in a deck meeting or in an annual meeting or something along that line. And even between two people, uh, that's an important aspect. Okay, I'm going to go to one more. Uh, so far, tell me what you think while I move to the next next section. Tell me what you're thinking. What do you feel? What have you heard? What What's happening with you? Anything? Well, I have a question. I okay. have a question, and, and that really has to do with if there's a breakdown of communication completely, what is the best way? Obviously, conflict has started. You're sensing it, and you're sensing that there's no, there's a complete breakdown of communication. What's the best way to get that ball rolling again? Then, it, first of all, if I'm sensing that it's other people are there, we're not going to resolve it today, then I will say, can we postpone this and we'll meet again and get an agreement of a date? I'd like to be able to get this maybe tomorrow. Can we meet at two o'clock tomorrow? You give them a time and a place that you can do that. Can we get on Zoom? Can we make a phone call? Are you okay? If somebody is so upset or so angry and they say no, then you ask them, when can I expect that we would be able to resolve this? Because it needs to be resolved. There is, There has to be a need there because I have a high interest in that. I'm thinking along the line of dealing with, with contests. That's a high interest for us. And if you are just going to say, oh, no, forget it. No, because contests are important. So there are high interests there. So I think if I would give somebody 24 hours and then come back to them again. I often try to have them meet me in places that have a nice environment, like at a coffee shop outside or someplace where they feel non-threatened. I find that helps also. But if they are saying, no, I don't want to do this, then I, I would certainly move through the process of uh, having a mediator there or or a person a third person to help and they then that's another whole skill of mediating 
for a, 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 a two people or a group that's not going. Okay. Does that make sense, AJ? Yeah, thanks. That's helpful. Can I ask you a question? Ah, absolutely, Christy, go right ahead. So I'm president of my club. I've been that for a while since COVID, like many. Uh -huh. Oh, okay. And I've been a member of Toastmasters for 13 years. And uh -huh. so I have a mix in the club of people that are brand new. Uh -huh. And quite honestly, because of Newport Center's reputation and the people I learned from, starting out with Colette Gardner, who was sort of an icon in the whole organization for many years. Uh -huh. Some of the greatest speakers that I've heard in Toastmasters have come out from that Newport Center group. There are people, you know, 30, 40 plus years in the in the club. Mm -hmm. And so I was brought into Toastmasters from a very high professional manner. And you either, you either played by the rules or you were out. Mm -hmm. uh, and so with new people coming in, there's a little slipping and a sliding because you don't want to blow them off. Um, and, and yet you want them to adhere to the principles that have been successful in the organization. Where I'm going with this is there's a particular person that has assert, not even on the board, by the way, <laughs> has asserted, well, that's how that person wants to deal with let's just say the awe counter is deciding not to ring the bell unless they've done three in a row and then they start and that's not been our principle and when you say consensus would you mm -hmm. recommend as the president of an organization that you throw it out to the table meaning well we've got you know x amount of people in the group and how do you feel about that or do you take them aside for coffee like you're suggesting? As president, you know, the executive board can make a decision about that. It's probably in our charter somewhere, or maybe it's some rule. I don't know, but it's always been that way for the 13 years I've been involved. And I'm just curious how you would handle that because I know that the members are not getting as good. I mean, that awe and um situation is one of the first things that we learn to conquer. And so I don't want to be changing rules that I know already work. So what would your recommendation be? Okay, Christy, one of the very first steps you I would want to know is what does this other person think? And I would not do that in front of other people. I would pull them to a side after a meeting or sometime and say, tell me a little bit more. Now, I'm going to give you some language phrases and shortly to help you dig that kind of stuff out. But you cannot resolve anything until you understand what their thinking is. It's what do they perceive here? Once you have the idea of perception, then you, de you determine what is the best way for you, for your club. And it may be that you discuss it in executive meeting how does the executive team want to handle this situation that has come up if that person is on the board i would give that person an opportunity to share their their view they're not on the board uh, yeah then then i would i would have the executive team then i would announce it to the whole club that the executive team has made a decision that for this time, for this period, for this till June, we are doing this and we want the cooperation of everybody. Okay. So that's basically asserting the role as president. Yes, you are a leader. You are that, and that is a leading uh, strategy of, of uh, but you didn't make that decision uh, alone you That's... have the team behind you although i have three roles <laughs> yeah well i understand that too yeah. and but Charlotte, that help yes go ahead uh, when when there's a break i i have a comment in chat that we haven't talked yeah about. go ahead go ahead all right kelly redman recommends a book that she has read called wait i'm working with who by peter <laughs> If you've ever heard of it, I don't know, but it, it tells you how to use consensus with a toxic environment or someone. Uh, excellent. I'll have to read that. I haven't read that. That's great. 
Thank you for that suggestion. Thank you, Kathy. I, I, I also recommend when I get to some strategies, there's a, a giving to yes is another one that is very well done. And TI uses it uh, for their, their conflict process. Well, I also wanted to say, Charlotte, in, in regards to the issue that was raised by, was it Christy? Yes. Uh -huh. Okay. Uh -huh. <clears throat> Truly what she's talking about, what she's encountering is similar to that slide that you had at the beginning of your presentation that has to do with expectations and different cultures. Mm -hmm. Many times when a new person comes into Toastmasters, they don't get all the things that are going on because we're coming in with our outside world values. We're coming in with our business values mm -hmm. and a number of different cultural things where it would be considered an embarrassment. As an example here, it would be considered an embarrassment to blow a whistle or ring a bell or do anything when someone's trying to speak. And that could be what causes the new person to sort of sit there and go, no, nah, I'm not doing that. I, I, I can't do that. And now we've got conflict that's building unintentionally, right? We need to, as you say, understand why that person is feeling that way yeah. what before we thinking. get into, yeah. last time I checked, I'm the president and you're not. So this is right. the way it goes. Absolutely. It's again, it goes back to the old woman and the young woman. Mm -hmm. I, you cannot resolve anything until you understand the other person's thinking. And oftentimes we in leaders tend to want to make sure that they get what we want to say, but we don't take the time to understand what they're saying either. Uh, we're so set or rigid in our ways that we're not open. And I think it's extremely important for us to be open. But the important thing is to remember that we have values. And we need to remember integrity is one of those that Toastmaster deals with. So we... we we want to remain, that's a, a goal, that a value that we have. So our thoughts, our actions, our beliefs, all of that have to coincide with, and maybe what we need to do periodically is to have a speech on what those values are and what are the be, what is the behavior that happens with that. And I know that oftentimes when we talk about the mission, when we read the mission of the club every time, I have found that new people don't even know what a lot of those behaviors are. So uh, having a speech and breaking that down, because those become your standards by which you measure what we do and how we behave. So thank you, AJ, for that. Well, let's go into the process of resolving. The very first thing that's very important is that you plan. You do not enter a conflict without having thought through how you want to do this. You need to check to make sure you're okay with the steps before you ask someone to do what you're asking them to do. And you know, you can't give away something you don't have. So if you don't have a good understanding of what you think or what you believe or what you are, how you are behaving, you can't ask other people to be different because you're not there yourself. So planning and preparing is very important. I script out what I want to have said and what what I want to have happen so that I it may not go anywhere like that but at least I have a plan you're not going in with just random that's important the second thing you do is check your emotions where are you emotionally in this 
<laughs> Again, where are you with high interest, low interest, uh, whatever? Where are you in your emotions? Now, if you are a person that this is a trigger for you emotionally, you need to be aware of that. For instance, I have a tendency as a leader, it's one of my, my issues that I deal with all the time, is I don't like to be told what to do. That's one of my prejudices and biases. And my emotion immediately is to say, no, I'm not going to do that. So I've had to learn as a leader to take a breath, think through how I want to respond, and sometimes I've had to have that person wait at least 30 seconds while I do that. But I've had to practice in front of the mirror so that I can, I feel more comfortable doing that. I recommend that for everyone. The third step you do is to clarify the issue. You need to know exactly what the problem is because you're going to present that problem and make sure that they agree with that because they may perceive the issue completely different than you. So if you're going to come to some understanding, you have to have, you have to clarify the issue. This is, you have to agree to what the problem is. And then you have to set an intention. Do you, we want to resolve this or do we not? Is it too painful? Are we going to do it today? Is it going to take a couple of weeks? Is it going to take a couple of months to do that? So you have to plan. What is your intention? That's an important step. And then you explore options. And this is when I brainstorm together with the individual. And I will say, what do you think our solutions can be? I always put myself last. And if you haven't read Simon Senek's book on Leaders Eat Last, that book probably will help you to understand that you always give the other person the go-ahead first. You do it second. You don't impose yourself on them immediately. So you explore options, and then between the two of you, you pick the best option. Now, you may not come to an agreement at all. If you can't come to an agreement, you agree to disagree. And, and, and that's okay, too. That's a solution. You will never come to the point that uh, um, I, I, it just there are times when that will be okay, where you just don't disagree, or you will continue to disagree. And then you do it with a smile. Um, one of the things that my teachers told me when I was a principal, and it worked well for me, and it's worked well for me in Toastmasters, is that I behave with the three Fs. I'm friendly, so I smile anytime I'm talking. Doesn't matter whether it's negative or not, I'm smiling. And the, it's genuine. I, I try to be friendly in whatever tone or whatever. The second one is that I'm fair. I want a win-win situation. That's my goal. Doesn't mean I'll reach it, but that's my goal. The third F is that I'm firm with my principles. I will not sacrifice, nor will I do anything that goes against the values that Toastmasters has, if it's a Toastmasters activity. So... Any questions about that? Okay, let's go on and look at some strategies. And I've got to move along so we get through everything. Separate people from the problem. Do not combine. It's not a personality. It's a problem. Just look at the problem. Focus on interest, not your position. Generate options for mutual gain. And that's your win-win that I was talking about. And then try to use objective criteria, stuff that you both are going to be able to agree. 
And this is based on getting to yes. Uh, the book I mentioned from Roger Fisher and William Murray. More considerations, treat people respectfully. They are a human being. They deserve to be, even if you haven't been treated well, rise above it and treat people respectfully. Again, AJ mentioned about using the positive tone. Use active listening. Sometimes it's really hard when somebody has been on you about something for a long time, you just want to turn them off. And as a teacher, I learned to turn people off real quickly. Um, you know, I can be doing other things and working with one student while there is noise going on in the other part of the room. But I want, you've got to be active. You've got to be attentive in this process. Again, you examine others' perspective. You ask questions. You get clarity on what it is that they are dealing with. And then also uh, the negative attributes, um, avoiding negative attributes. And, and I am not able to see the last one on my, could somebody tell me what it is? Solve conflict when it's small. Aha, yeah, thank you, AJ. That is important. Don't wait until it becomes a big issue. Don't make mountains out of a molehill. Okay, again with emotions. Acknowledge the person and their and the behavior or that you are aware of where that they are important. Uh, one of the things that I think Toastmaster clubs do not do enough is to acknowledge the person who is there, not just in a conflict, but acknowledging someone who came to that meeting. Golly, John, I'm sure glad you're here with us tonight. Thank you for coming. Just do, setting that tone is important. And again, a maintaining a respectful response to others' intense emotion. Don't let your emotion, don't take on their emotion for you. Just kind of, and sometimes if someone has a real serious issue, then I will write down everything that is said so that I don't get caught up in the emotional aspect of what's going on. And I will just say to them, do you care if I take notes so I get things clear? And most of the time, I've never had anybody say no. So that's helpful. Uh, don't take on their issue if it's not yours. Stick to facts. Stick to facts. And then soften your tone. Now, let's talk a little bit about some language that can be used. And I'm going to ask you in the group to read what is on the slides. Because I want you to pretend that you are in a conflict and you're making these statements. And I have about four slides that will help do that language. So let's have some fun with it. Does, would someone please take number one? I need Thank someone. you for your information. I wanna take some time to think about it. Excellent, excellent point. Number two, would someone read number two, please? I'd, I'd like, like to explore your point ahead, of view. Kathy. Go ahead. Sorry. That's all right. Sorry. Kathy, go ahead. I'd like to explore your point of view further. Are you willing? Good. Okay. Uh, Mark, you want to do the... It was it Mark? That was me. I respectfully oh. disagree. Uh -huh. And you can end it there. Um, there isn't a whole lot of ammunition they can give back to you to keep that conflict going. So it's great. All right. Next one, please. I'll do it. I hear, I hear what you're saying and very much respect your point of view. However, I see it differently. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, the next one. I want this one. This is a critical situation because ellipsis. <laughs> Good, okay. The last one. I'm sorry, someone, please. 
Um, I'm, I'm sorry. sorry. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm sorry if I misunderstood your intent. Can we go over it again? Good. Excellent. All right. Now let's try one more slide with this. Next one, someone, you can read. Sophia, repeat. go ahead, Sophia. Yeah, I, I know you want to do a good job. Let's work this out together. And of course, you're leading them with a positive. They could come back and say, no, I don't want to work together. But most often they won't because you've led with a positive. Good. Next one. I'm, I'm not sure if you understood what I was trying to convey at the meeting on Friday. I meant blah, 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 whatever. Okay. So what you're doing is you're letting them know that you know you didn't understand, but this is what you were trying to do. The next issue, please. This is how. Someone? This, this is, is how. how. Oh. Go ahead. Go ahead. This is how I see the issue. Can we come together on this? Aha. Uh -huh. Excellent. Next one. I sent you an email and made a follow-up phone call. But didn't hear back. Did you receive either of them? Uh-huh. <laughs> I'm checking for understanding here. And that brings up a very important point. If you want to make sure that somebody understands what you have said to them, there are a couple of ways you can do that. It's called checking for understanding. You can ask them in a nice way, what they heard. What did you just hear me say? Because you're checking to make sure that you said what your intent was. Another way to do that, whenever I ask someone to, I will say to, let's say I would say to Sophia, Sophia, I would like for you to tell AJ what you heard me tell, what I heard, what I said. What would you say to AJ? if you were to tell her what I just commented. That gives it like you're telling someone else. So it's another way of making sure that you get a better understanding. It's called paraphrasing back what they have heard. And if you're doing active listening, that's an important part of this. Now, if you want them to elaborate more on what they've said, you can ask these kinds of, or make these statements or ask questions. Do you have additional thoughts? Or share with me additional thoughts. Is there anything else that I should know once they've explained that? Or I'd like to know how you feel about. And Christy, this is what you could do. I'd like to know how you feel about such and such and so and so in talking with your person about the all counter. Or perhaps you could tell me more about. Those are lead-ins when you want to gain, you want them to elaborate more on their on their explanation of anything. And then clarifying statements. These I use all the time. What I hear you saying is, <laughs> this is my perception of what I heard you say. Could you give me a specific, specific example of your idea or what you're trying to tell me? Give me more specific things. Or I'm not sure I understand what you're saying. Can you say it again? Do you have a particular solution in mind? Those are all very good statements to help further the language. Those are great suggestions. I've been, uh, uh, Dr. Noggle, as you are going through those, I've been repeating them, voicing them out. Those are great, great, great uh, statements for all of us to practice and good. use. Thank you so very much. You're welcome. Now, this is reflective. I don't think we as individuals do enough reflective on our own behavior. 
or what we sound like to somebody else or what how we are perceived. And so if I want to reflect on what has been said, it sounds as if you really are, you have a high interest in what we're doing. It sounds as if you really want to solve this based on what you have said, or it sounds as if you really want to ignore this conflict. That's what I'm hearing, those kinds of statements. Do you think it's a good idea if we do da 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 da? You believe or think that? Uh, I always, if somebody makes a comment that I know that is a belief that they have, I will clarify that that is a belief. Do you really believe that? Is that really what your thinking is? So those are uh, some good reflective statements. Now we're going back to you know, Charlotte. I I just had a aha moment here on oh, that other good. slide. I love aha moments. What? Well, we have this module in Pathways that's called the Active Listening module, where you're supposed to run table topics. As if I don't know if you can go backwards to that that other slide you were just on, but yeah, I can go back. Imagine if you would. We're running active listening for reflective statements and say the theme is love is in the air. How do you feel about Valentine's Day? So I ask this as the as the table topics, but I'm practicing reflective statements as part of my active listening project. Mm -hmm. So I asked Mark, Mark, what do you think about Valentine's Day? Go ahead and unmute. And just give me your first your first thought <laughs> i shrink in horror from it <laughs> like most guys just joking <laughs> it sounds as if you're really scared of the entire idea of valentine's day uh just joking you know so i'm see, just playing into the, the male stereotype that you all have exactly so now we've got more communication going charlotte so i yeah. see how this could be used with the active listening project and learning in fun environments, right? Taking a theme like love is in the air, but really practicing reflective statements that we can use in conflict situations or or yeah. um, diluting conflict situations. Yeah. yeah. But remember, thank you, AJ. That's an excellent idea. And I might use that for my next club table topics. Um, Charlotte, can I ask you a question? Yes. I, I, like I said, I've been in the club for yeah. a long time, and I've never, ever seen a situation where anyone has ever asked someone to leave the club because uh -huh. that like, bad apple can spoil the whole group thing. Mm -hmm. I'm just curious how you, do you feel there's always a method such as you've described today to deal with when you see something becoming toxic and you've got to look at the the better of all the people in the group as well because they feel it too and yes, i'm not sa i'm not saying that about this particular case but it brings to mind the question i'm asking and i'm just curious i have experienced that in one of my clubs when i was president we had an individual that had some some issues mental issues and she would explode often uh, at people. Um, she was other times she was okay. Uh, you people have issues that you don't even know about them, but she would explode often. Um, she had been spoken to uh, by her mentor. I asked her mentor to talk to her first, um, and then. Uh, I, I sought some help with some other people, whether I was on the right track. But I finally, when she, when she picked up a, a pen mm. to um, hurt someone with it, then I made the decision to ask her to leave. But we had dealt with conflict. I had taken her out for coffee many times. 
but she was not on medication. And she admitted to me she was not. And so until she got on her medication, I told her she could not return. So, but, but that's an extreme case, my goodness. But um, I, I think as a leader, if you see something that is happening with, that it's starting to brew, you take people aside and you talk to them privately about what you are experiencing, no, what you are experiencing, what you see. And so you use I statements, not you statements in that. You say, I'm seeing this behavior. Uh, do you see yourself doing this? Is this something that is common outside of the club? Help me understand what's going on. What am I experiencing right now? So that I'm getting more facts. I want facts about what's going on. And again, that's all communication. It all comes down to communication and how well I can listen, how well I can ask the right questions to get the information I want. Because you do not have a right to explore parts of their lives that are private to you. You just don't have the right to do that. So you have to be able, that's why it's important to plan and get your questions down of what you want. You write them out so that you know what you're doing and not doing it off the top of your head. Does that help? Yes. Gives you some, yes. And we do have that on occasion. Um, all right, going on. I want to go back a minute. Now I'm going to ask you, um, what changes maybe, you know, learning means you go from point A to point B. You entered this workshop at point A and my delivery tried to move you to point B to see if there are some changes or some ideas or things that you learned that you hadn't thought or maybe even reinforced you more than what you had. So I'm going to ask you to share with me now your thoughts, looking at the objectives, looking at the tools that we had, looking at the ideas that we sparked, looking at the resolving with others and the use of the language. Looking at those four areas, share what you have taken with you or what you will you might use in the future that will make your beliefs stronger, your words better, your actions stronger, habits, so forth. So I'm going to open it up to anyone who would like to begin because I really want this feedback from you. Otherwise, you have not been as actively involved as I'd like you to be. So share what you're taking away or what you've learned. Charlotte, run for Congress. Yeah. <laughs> no, thank you. That's too much conflict. <laughs> no, no. I think no. you could solve it. You could solve the conflicts. Or at least... <laughs> Charlotte, I have one. I, I want to answer your question, if, you, if I may. You um, may. I was in your in the last uh, lay session that you did, and between those two times, I this reinforced what you said the first time to me. And what I what I picked up from this is that there was a conflict in one of my clubs years ago that I did not handle as properly as I should have. Uh -huh. I did not ask the person their opinion. I just said, "This is what we think. This is what is, I am president. This is this is your answer. You know, cut this out, behavior out." But not, I didn't say it that way. I was trying to be diplomatic, but cut basically it was cut the behavior out or leave because we don't, this is not acceptable. And it wasn't acceptable, but I didn't have to say it that way. And so I've learned that I should have had said, you know, I understand this is your opinion. These are your beliefs. But in our, our club, uh, the, it's called the Contrarians, and we ha had a uh, uh, motto that no topic is taboo. Unfortunately, it got into... Uh, right-wing politics a lot mm. and that was his only go-to uh 
thing he was every every utterance out of his mouth had something to do with it and then it became attacking other people's opinions okay. and that's when i had to step in great thank you for sharing that so can and you name something specifically that you would do differently i would certainly say to him i would i i sent an email to the group and said you know uh, basically, that the, our shared values are this, and and when those share and the shared assumption is because we are a club that has controversial topics, uh -huh. that we we all can uh, say that in a safe environment. When that assumption breaks down, feelings become hurt. Now, I should have said it to him first, and yeah. then okay, an email to the club. Good. All right. Thank you for sharing. Someone else? Charlotte, there was a chat message from Kelly. Okay. okay. She said the perception is really helpful. That picture was a great example of that. Oh, good. Yeah, it really gets into the detail to move somebody from a, from one point to another point. Yeah, point of view. Yeah, thank you. Who else? What else? Please share. Well, Charlotte, on the... Gandhi quote. Uh huh. I started thinking about this in terms of club culture. Yep. That your beliefs, right? We bring this grouping of, it starts with 20 people, maybe goes down to eight, maybe goes up. But your beliefs, the beliefs become your thoughts, your thoughts become your words. Mm -hmm. And when we're developing this you don't see it happening and the next thing you know you've got a closed culture and the new person comes in and they're never going to fit in to that club unless we're constantly checking ourselves mm -hmm. right? and perhaps maybe that's the reason why we ask clubs to do the moments of truth but maybe what we really need to do is to recognize gandhi's quote at the beginning of every meeting that your beliefs become your thoughts, your thoughts become your words, your words become your actions. So let's have the best actions we can have during this club meeting. If you start, thank you, AJ. If you start examining people's behavior, you can figure out pretty much what they believe because they are exemplifying those actions. Um, it, it's really interesting. People who read other people have learned how to do that. And then you validate it by asking, gee, I see that you did this. Do you believe about that? And you can validate whether, you're, whether your thinking is on the right track or not. Um, I think educators become very skilled at doing this because we read people all the time. And um, so, and I can, I can pretty well, if someone is acting in a way that doesn't fit the beliefs that Toastmaster has, then as a leader, it's your responsibility to help them understand what we what how we behave and how we act in in toastmaster clubs okay anyone we another we do have another chat message okay this one is from mark laverne and he says the various sets of phrases that charlotte shared during the last third of her presentation to be used in chat sessions with someone you're trying to understand better were very, very helpful. We should all study them, practice and internalize them and have them ready to use when the situation warrants. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you, Mark. And Andrew Craner just typed in, he was unable to see the old woman, but he has said he has visual perception issues, but makes him think that he needs to ask more trusted advisors before going to attempt to resolve it with people. Okay. Well, Anyone else? Have, I don't want to end this if someone is still dying to share a communication with us. 
<laughs> I appreciate I appreciate you being involved. I want to thank the team. I want to thank you first for being a good participant, but I want to thank my team, Mark, thank you for being our tech person and uh, Kathy for being my room monitor, AJ for partnering with me. I really appreciated that. And Kathy, thank you for inviting me to have this opportunity to share. So I will return conduct back to you. Thank you, Dr. Charlotte Noggle for this wonderful session today. I hope everyone here in the room really enjoyed the session today. And please remember to thank Charlotte for this presentation. Provide your feedback in the link that Mark Laverne has shared in the chat. Thank you. I have one last question, Kathy. Sure. For the situation that was identified by Christy, where she's got conflict that's building up in the club and she's not quite sure she's a 13 year veteran but for some clubs you know it's the president's first round can the district uh help out does the district have resources do we have like a a mini charlotte in a box or something like that that can help if conflict breaks out in a club i I'm available. There's a need for Charlotte in the box sometimes. <laughs> I will be available if someone really needs to talk through something. I'd be happy and I have a I am very uh careful about not talking out of school. Yeah, Margarina, uh, Mariana. Yes. Yes, thank you. Uh, I just we have a we had a situation in my area, not my club, but another club had issues, and then the area director noticed it, and she called in the division director, and they fixed it. And now the club is flourishing. But last year they were at the verge to close down, so they didn't even have to go to the district level. The division director could help them. Are they did the moment of truth, and they figured it out, and now they are doing very well good thank you for sharing that i'm glad to hear that well, i'm glad we've got a place to go if we if we need to if we need a shoulder to cry on i'm glad we've got yours charlotte thank you aj absolutely thank you. thank you okay i think that i agree I'm with charlotte you I'm about with four minutes agent. early <laughs> <laughs> Okay, Kathy. Thank Are we you. Because um, as club president, when I had that conflict, I felt way out of my comfort zone and way in the wind, just flailing, not sure who to call, call or ask. Or so it led to more sleepless nights than it should have. So I'm glad you're around oh. personally. Thank you. Charlotte, I'm, I just I'm not to... successful 100% of the time either. So, you know, we work with human beings. So we're not robots. No. Charlotte, I just wanted to express my thanks for your presentation. Uh, I agree with the person that talked about the tips that you gave. And they're very helpful. I can see exactly how that would work. And uh, I appreciate it. Thank you. Mega dittos. Mega dittos. Thank you, Christy. Thanks. Speak for all of us. Yeah. Thank you. Yep. All right. Have a great rest of your weekend.